as Māori rather than relying on the government to to for your rangatiratanga. You need to have a rangatiratanga mindset. As a uh, researcher, right, you think, man, this, we're lucky. Oh, at the end of the two days, oh, it's actually fai mana, fai rawa, fai oranga, mm-hmm. wina. If that's not right, we're never going to be right. All the diaries, all the accounts say our people dominated commercial fishing. Steeped in your reo, steeped in your, um, you know, Māori culture, you can do anything in this world. Yeah, remember he kati ke kiakwe, he to fai wahi tanga mai ki tene podcast. Um, eme hi ana kiakwe. Um, yeah, so I think we'll we'll start the the corridor all with just just who are you, ko wai kwe, and then we'll sort of we'll we'll flow on from that. Um, ko kiri rehana to ko ingoa he uru apui me te raroa i te taha to ko papaks he uru ingo. I tuhoi te whakatoia i te taha toku mama. Noho ana te puke, arahau. Um, yeah. Cool. I, uh, rangahau or a scientist researcher at uh, University of Waikato doing my PhD in Tuangi for the Sustainable Seas Project. So, so what sort of got you into the to the science world? You know, what, where, where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> um... It's kind of a funny story, actually. <laughs> uh, my dad's best friend up in Tamaki was doing an environmental course at Awanui Arangi, and it was half mātauranga and half sciences. Um, it was environmental studies, they called it, because they didn't recognise mātauranga or sciences at, at that time. Um, they probably still don't now. I uh, <laughs> don't know why I said that. <laughs> um so, yeah, it was a part-time course. I was working full-time at the time, and my dad's mates, oh, yeah, come on, it's uh, six weeks and you'll have a tour here. I was like, oh, yeah, sounds good. And it was three and a half years, <laughs> so I'm like, seriously? <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. So it was, um, the first project was collecting different shells, actually, of the moana and identifying them in English, Māori, and Latin. So that was really cool. Uh, yeah, and then the next one was bugs, and then um, Duraco. And a fern, so yeah, I just got hooked on it after that. That was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. And it was in the environment. And it sounded like they had somewhat of a, you know, your role at the time had somewhat of a, you know, an element of te reo and Māori and, and te ao Māori. Was that sort of something that sort of interested you? Oh, absolutely. And because we had to do a first level te reo paper as well. So we could, um, because it was Awanui Arangi. So that was um, compulsory anyway, so that was really cool. But yeah, I, d- I didn't grow up with Māori. Um, both my parents um, told us that we couldn't get jobs if we learnt Māori. So I'm a part of that generation um, where my father had it beaten out of him, so there was no way they wanted us talking Māori. So I guess I'm on the tail end of that generation who didn't get that kind of stuff. But we always grew up on Māori um, and Marae anyway because we were at Tangis, so that that was always there. It was just we went and I'll speak that all. So, yeah, it was really cool mm. to go in and see the world through our Māori eyes, and that was okay. And to start learning the the reo to go with it as well. So, yeah, I loved it. Quit my other job and did it full time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, sort of like the, the the background in science, you were out in the tile and 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 sort of, you know, was, was that something that. I guess interested you as well. Obviously, now you're doing a co-papa around the moana. You know, was was sort of that was there always a natural pull? Oh, absolutely. My father's a real fisherman anyway, so we always spent all our some um, our childhood in the um at the beach at the moana. I used to have a hot plate and cook cockles and pippies on the plate, and we'd play there all day long. And then we'd because we my parents had four small children, obviously, and poor hara is. <laughs> that was our fun. And my dad's from um, the bush up north, so if we went home, we were always in the bush up there. And my mum's from Fakatane, so she's right on the, the water down at the heads there. So we spent all our summers either at the beach or up on the bush anyway. So it was just natural, natural thing that my parents do. They still do, they didn't realise it. And that's mātauranga. Ah, you, you brought up the buzzword. The key word, mātauranga, <laughs> mātauranga Māori. Um, obviously, we're at, you know, Papakitua Nangatai Symposium and, you know, there's a big backing from the um, 
uh, sustainable seas and sort of, you know, science and research and, you know, really like knowledge, really. Ma tauranga. Um, tell me a little bit about your the project that you've been working on. Uh, so um, the project I'm working on is the Tuangi and Ohiwa. So my mother, um, Whakapapas, to Ohiwa. And I actually spent some time there in my 20s living on our family land. And funny enough, um, I was telling one of the other PhD students, actually when I was younger, I was staying on our family's whenua because some of our family was cutting the trees down. So my auntie put me there to stop the other family from cutting the trees down. So it was kind of funny now that I've come back and I'm actually working in the Moana side of things. So I have a real affiliation with the Ohiwahabe anyway. Um, and I ended up on this particular project because I'd met Kura at a conference. I've known her for quite a while. And she said, oh, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm looking for a new job, actually. And she's like, oh, have you ever thought of a PhD? And I went, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a lot of work. And I was like, hmm. She goes, I have a think about it. She goes, oh, I'll send this through a brief and see what you think. And when I got it, my uncle was one of the co-marts on the board. I went, oh, that's a tohu. So I think I better go and do that. <laughs> Obviously, I'm being called there because I've been working up north on my dad's family side for quite a few years. And then I hit it up there funny enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tile, tile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, exactly. <laughs> um, it just calls me home wherever I am anyway. So, yeah, when I saw that, I thought, oh, yeah, this is next few years. Mm. And, and sort of what is the, you know, what is the mahi? What, are, what is um, Well, it's looking at, so uh, there's three tribes around Ohiwa. Um, so it's Natiawa, Motuhoi, and Whakata, Te Whakatohia. And the tuangi there have declined in size and uh, abundance uh, quantity over the years. And they don't have much data on why that's happening um, and what can they do to look at future management of them. Uh, Council's been taking data there for quite a few years in different spots. Um, so we used a lot of some of the data they've already collected. And then um, we did all the mātauranga on the Ngāti Awa side. So we met the traditional harvesting beds. Um, interviewed the Komata around well, what did they noticed. Um, and luckily, uh, Whakatohia was doing an impact on Modi Hui at the same time. So we got to hear the themes of what they think impacted our Kaimana, not just the two, the Kaimana over time and uh, Ohiwa. So that was really neat actually, listening to all their kōrero and just the things that have happened that they know made, made a difference on why the populations have changed. Mm. And can you remember sort of some of the, the key aspects of what they were saying? Because yeah. I feel, oh yeah, awesome. Because I feel like in a, you know, from a sci from a Western science perspective, it's like, this is X, Y, Z, this is all, you know, matches up. Oh, whereas yeah. Matauranga is somewhat like, you know, it's, it's like magical. Almost, you know what I mean? It's got different memories to it. You know, it's more social impacts. Um, A lot of it's colonial impacts that happened, like, um, I was really shocked to find out that I think it was from the 1920s to the 1960s they had what they call a night cart in Ohiwa and it used to collect all the tickle in the area and then dump it at the mouth of one of the rivers. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was, a, that was I was really shocked by that. So obviously that impacted, impacted our kaimana um, and that happened for a very long period of time obviously before um, we had sewerage systems and all those other things. Uh, there was another really cool thing that happened there. Is since 1965, um, the council wanted to actually put a sewage treatment farm in Ohiwa too. So what they did is they asked all the locals, do you know where there are um, shellfish beds? We want to map them and, you know, do you object to us doing this? Of course everybody objected, but the really cool thing was all the Māori and even the Pākehā mapped out all the beds in 1965 on different shellfish and that. So there's a real clear pattern of what there used to be there in 1965 compared to what there is today. And we've shown that just um, through this work. So could have mapped a lot of the muscle beds in 2007 and that, and just the changes that have happened to those. So now that we've got some base information on the beds of the cockles, <laughs> We could possibly go back to look at that 65 information, but mostly that was around the muscle beds. Mm. And then they just said random shellfish beds instead of not specifically cockles or puppies or anything like that, unfortunately. So, And and sort of the, I guess the, the overarching theme was is the, the population was declining. Yeah. 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 Those changes. Yeah. I guess just the history of the harbour is very different than what it used to be. It used to be quite deep. 
So they would have, they used to have a, I think it was a ferry that used to cross there. That's how deep it was. It was like, wow, you can't imagine that now. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Is there sort of anything that you've sort of noticed throughout your, your journey in terms of like Mātauranga Māori that was, that's quite been quite impactful for you? Yeah, um, definitely. What's been kind of really cool is that science has just backed up wow, how people did those things because our people already knew, like the harvesting beds and everything, they were there for a reason. And the tohu, so um, there's always been the understanding of the toria associate, toria is the oyster catcher, and there's a, um, a whakatauki actually, I'll get it, I'll read it for you. Uh, ka whati te, te tai, ka pao te torera, toria. So when the tide recedes, the toria strikes. And funny enough, um, so I did the, an annual season of where all the money were across our sites, and the harvesting beds had toria over them the whole year round. And I thought, yeah, our people are so smart, they're so onto it. And then we picked up other things like anemones and um, barnacles and that at different areas too. And so those um, sort of had an, haven't you know, empirically done this yet, but it, it's looking like that the sand mud composition of those species have very specific areas that they like to um, be in habitats, live in the habitats. So that's really inf interesting information. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I think it's just fascinating to think back to our ancestors and, and think, ah, oh, they knew this stuff. Right. You know, they didn't have technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All these lights, you know. They, <laughs> they were just out there like, yeah, that's a buzzy bird. Yeah. What's it doing out there? Exactly. It's always around there at this time. <laughs> right. Was well, that's the whole thing. We did everything on the maramataka, and it was always on the tangaroa moon that we did um, our collections, and we went out. So we got to look at the tuangi and their optimal condition all the time, and we did that across the whole year. So at every season, it correlated, and it was really cool. Yeah. yeah. So our people knew the environment well, and because that was their life system, and so I think who was telling a story about that? Oh, the MC. Okay, he was talking about how he went to um, one of the outer islands of Rarotonga. He's like, oh, man, oh, your knowledge is really amazing. You should come and do a talk on that. And, and the local was like, mm, if we don't know this stuff, we die. Yeah. And it was the same, actually, that come up in the interviews too. They lived off the land, so they didn't have any choice. If you didn't know those cycles, movements, um, when the particular fish are coming in, all those things, they didn't survive, so... They were very connected. Yeah, very connected to mm. the environment. And do you think that in terms of like the space that we're in now with, with research, Mātauranga Māori, you know, is it becoming more acceptab accepted? Is it coming more, you know? <laughs> you can be on it. Don't you know? that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or is there, you know, is there an appetite for it? Or is it sort of, is it still, a, you know, whawhai tonu, you know? <laughs> Yes, there's an appetite for it, and yes, there's still whawhai around it. Um, you know, other cultures, other cultures, um, I guess, uh, um, uh, resist change. Uh, they don't like change because they're not in control of it. We seem to be more flexible. We, we move with the currents, you know, for the betterment of ourselves. So we, we're not as resistant, but other cultures, yeah. You might have heard stuff on the TV. <laughs> well, I guess it isn't science and all that kind of stuff. I feel like maybe one of the differences is that, you know, I think intrinsically within Māori in our culture is like, ko te moana koe, koe ko te moana. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, it's they're not separate. Not at all. one and the same. Yeah. You know? And our intrinsic connection like that is kind of different from other cultures, I would definitely say. So they don't get it. I've had people say to me, well, why do you have to do it? Why does it mean so many things? Why can't it just mean one thing? It's like, because the world is complex. Mm. Our taiao is complex and our tupuna understood it in a real intimate way, especially those connections and complexities to each other. You know, That's why they knew where the manu were and what they were doing. That Obviously, if they're getting food and they're eating and they're living, that's we should follow. Um, I think Jack was talking about that, about following the whales and things like that. Our people were onto watching the tohu and following this tohu because they depended, their survival depended on it. So mm. we don't do that as much because we've got such a convenient world now. But In terms of sort of, um, I guess, like applying 
you know, research and, and science and, and, you know, this really to the, to the normal regular civilian don't really know too much about what's going on and, you know, in this really important research, like, is there, is there sort of things that you could suggest for, for people to sort of, you know, do help, you know, what, what, what are some tangible things that like a regular person could do to sort of support the, 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 the mission, the kaupapa, the moana, to taia? <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> um, getting involved. Yeah. But, uh, getting connected, I think, is really important because we are very disconnected from our taia now, not just our moana from our ngahere. But there's quite a big movement now back towards reconnecting, I think, and our people anyway. There's a big... Um, you know, big push for the rangatahi to keep being involved, to start understanding. Um, yeah, it's way more than when I was a kid. It wasn't even an option when mm. we were younger. Now it's like, this is a real, you know, this is a career. This is a real career. You can do this and you can do it in such a multifaceted way too. There's so much different areas you can contribute to it now. So, you know, find your groove. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. And in terms of like the, you know, the journey that you've had and just sort of reflecting on that, you know, do you, have you, are you looking back and are you sort of proud? Are you happy that you sort of stuck at it? You know, are you, are you looking back going, oh, actually like, it's a really, like, well, not looking back, but you're still in it now, but you know, you're still yeah. sort of appreciating being a researcher and sort of being connected to Tile and, you know, I'm one. Yeah, it's been a reconnection with not just the tail for me, but to my whānau as well. I've turned up at places thinking, what am I doing here for a research project? And then found all my papa and every person that I've spoken to. So, you know, it's in my heart, I truly believe my tūpuna have been calling me to these spaces because then they're connecting me to the people and the reason why I need to be in these spaces too. So, yeah, I really, I'm really loving it, enjoying it and, Glad that this is where I got called to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's so beautiful. And I mean, I guess looking forward to, you know, we had our symposium, we had the poor fiddy, we had all our youngsters there, and there was a lot of talk about, you know, to our poor poor tanga, and you know, they're next. You know what I mean? And these things are for our our youth and our rangatahi. Sort of, what what do you have to say to that reanga, that generation? I think it's really important. But it's got to be something that they're really passionate about too. Um, but they're blessed that they, you know, somebody was talking about being at this kota. We never had those kind of things when they're young. So they're being offered the opportunities we could never have dreamed of. So that in itself is, you know, living the vision of our ancestors. That, um, yeah, they're definitely the face of our tupuna, aren't they, today? No. I don't know, the wildest imagination, it's the wildest I, dreams, I think, is exactly. all, all that I've heard is like, exactly. It's when they came here, this is what they envisioned, you know, us sort of growing and developing and sort of, you know, taking on the world, I guess. And we claim our rangatira tanga and our whenua and our taiao as well. So, mm. yeah. And and I guess lastly, like, is there any sort of anything from the research project or anything that we might have missed that was quite important that people, you know, should know or you know that we want to talk about or i think they've got opportunities we could never dream of now um, especially with technologies and how quickly they're advancing and how quickly they're changing the world too i mean as if you can harness those um steeped in your real steeped in your um you know maori culture you can do anything in this world anything's possible Mean well, thank you so much, Kitty, for your quarter or today. Really appreciate it. First one, yeah, we got there, we got there. But now, really appreciate it. You did, you did, did a fantastic job, and I just really and, and you know, thank you for the rich quarter and sharing your mato and your knowledge with us. Well, no, thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>